good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to talk to you today about digital outputs of collaborative humanities research projects. So I'm not going to talk about my own research, but more give you an overview of some of my experiences working on research projects. Um, just to give you a little bit of background about myself, uh, I wrote a PhD on the rock cut monasteries of the Western Ghats in India, and a GIS database formed a central plank of that thesis. The appendix to the thesis um, included many pages of printouts of, uh, of uh, spreadsheet files, uh, which are completely unusable today. So I've learned the hard way about data management. Um, I've also worked as a software developer and as, and as a database administrator and I'm now the work for the Beyond Boundaries project at the British Library as GIS research curator. Um, throughout the presentation, I'm also going to discuss a previous project that I worked on, which was um, mapping the Jewish communities of the Byzantine Empire, also ERC funded. And um, we, we did some things well on that project and we did some things quite badly as well, I'm happy to admit. I mean, all in all, we delivered the digital outputs on time. They were two weeks late in the end, which is not bad as these things go. The primary one being this uh, um, online web mapping system. But I'm just going to refer to that a couple of times throughout the rest of the project. Okay, so digital outputs on collaborative, on humanities research projects can be divided into three different types, I would argue. Um, but we have data, resources, and tools. And I've arranged them in this uh, pyramid-like fashion because the, as we move up the levels on the pyramid, we have increasing technological complexity, <coughs> increasing in effort involved, um, with a potential payback in usability and the ability to change research behaviour. Now, that also comes with a risk as we're moving up, that the digital output will not be used, firstly, and secondly, there's uh, declining um, the, uh, the longevity of these digital outputs as we move uh, up the pyramid. So I would argue that any project needs to build a strong foundation here um, at the base before, before moving up. Um, and too many digital projects have gone straight in at the level of tools without um, thinking through these other aspects carefully. Now, you'll have to forgive me for this one, but um, we're not working in ancient Egypt, we're working in India. And so, uh, perhaps uh, Shikara, um, uh, this is it, the Kailasha Temple at Ellora, is a better uh, analogy than a pyramid. Anyway, um, so we're going to begin with the lowest level, data. So, everyone on the Beyond Boundaries project is generating data, and you'll be seeing their presentations throughout the day today. And these data, um, are going to be deposited in a raw form for download and hopefully um, in a more uh, organised fashion than this. Now, there's plenty of different repositories available for depositing data, um, but our project deals with Zenodo. Now, why? Why are we depositing these data on Zenodo? Well, the first reason is you have to. Okay, um, now to comply with grant rules and, uh, and our delegates from the ERC, etc., we have to deposit the data. But I would also go further than that and say there are very many good reasons for doing so too. Um, firstly, there are all the reasons associated with open data generally. Now, um, justifying taxpayers' investment is an important one. Um, if the data is on Zenodo, those data are not going to be lost. Uh, secondly, um, I think there's some particularly uh, important reasons for our project um, so are related to developing countries. Um, we should allow researchers in developing countries to see our work. We're dealing with, um, with Asia uh, and um, given the project aims of trying to break down regional historiographies and help scholars um, break down regional historiographies and boundaries between work, open data is important. So secondly, um, it's, it, I think it benefits the researchers themselves. So you can come back to your data in the future and use it. I mean, how many of you have had to fish through an old hard drive to 
to find your data set that you used six or seven years ago and found it totally unusable. It takes you days to work out what's going on and you can't recreate the analysis or digital outputs that you made at that time. So if you clean your data properly at this stage and deposit, somewhere, deposit it somewhere where you can find it again, um, it's going to be good for you. Um, secondly, the process of data deposition also and data cleaning also pr provides new insights. I, um, if you look at your data and you know your data that well that it's perfectly clean and that someone else can use it, you're going to have new um, insights generated from those data. And it also makes the findings of your publications more um, believable. So Zenodo is, uh, is, is a great platform as far as I'm concerned. Um, there are limitations, uh, various people have discussed some of those today, but flexibility is, uh, one, of the, is one of the key um, benefits of using Zenodo, and, um, but also one of the, uh, creates a lot of potential for problems too. Um, So the, the power of Zenodo is cumulative. The more data that goes on there and the better keywords are used across Zenodo, the um, more power uh, it has, the, more, the greater ability there is to link data sets together. And um, a, a, a final benefit I'm going to discuss is citation. So when you deposit your data on Zenodo, cite your data in your publications. Okay. I would argue that that is an excellent way to structure the data that you've put on there and it allows people to find your work as well. Um, people often tend to cite print publications, I do this myself, I, if there's a digital publication and a print publication I often just um, go and find the print publication in a, uh, even if I'm using the digital catalogue, go and find a reference to the print publication in a library catalogue uh, because um, I, d I because that's what I'm used to doing. But Zenodo does make it easy to cite. You'll, um, it, the citations have this type of structure and um, you can actually download a citation in various different formats on the platform as well. Um, so as I said, flexibility has its own problems and um, we need to make our data that we're depositing useful. Use useful and usable. There's no point in doing it if we don't. And with the flexibility of Zenodo comes a lot of problems with doing this. So I've got some tips here, and these are for the, the project researchers um, primarily, but uh, the rest of you can, should do be doing this too. Um, so deposit the data in the most basic formats you can find to avoid obsolescence. So we have textual data. I'm, I'm not going to comment on all these formats, but PDF-A is an archival PDF format. I would, if you have to uh, deposit in PDF, I would, I would, um, I would um, not recommend it. But if you have to, make sure you use PDF-A. It's easy on Acrobat. Go to Save As More. There's options PDF-A. It means the fonts and any other files that are associated with your PDF are actually embedded within that PDF. So it's not reliant on other files on the computer. Um, the other point was don't deposit in JPEG. I think Robert mentioned that earlier. They're a lossy format, which, which means they lose information when resaved. Okay, so I now draw your attention to the, the TXT format. Most of you are using um, text and will be saving, uh, and you need to save in Unicode. Okay, that's UTF-8. Now, it's a massive pain that Excel doesn't export UTF-8 as default. So every time you're exporting from SL, Excel is a CSV file, a comma separated variable, you have to um, save as in UTF-8. Otherwise, you're going to lose all your lovely diacritics. And I know you Sanskritists loved those. Um, and we'd be very upset without, without them. So I've, I've had a, okay, so do, do save as. Um, and if you take one thing away from this presentation, do not upload to Zenodo in doc or XLS format, okay? In the Beyond Boundaries communities, there are quite a lot of doc and XLS files, okay? Don't do it. Um, up, if you want to do that as well, okay, I suppose, but basic formats, these formats have to be the priority, okay? 
So what other tips have I got here? Um, structure, uh, clean your data. Use, um, data should be consistent. Um, we don't want multiple values in the same column, capitalization, lack of standardized terms, abbreviations. You, Use headings that are meaningful in your data, okay, and meaningful to other people with acronyms explained in the metadata. Um, importantly, look at the way other people have deposited their data and call things the same as what they have done, okay? Don't have everyone using different um, words for what is essentially the same entity, okay? Uh, keywords. Keywords are a very important part of Zenodo. Uh, now, you're going to make these up, we all do, right? But also look at what keywords other people are using. Zenodo searches keywords using diacritics as well, so be careful about that. Um, and if you're, if you're stuck for using them, the Library of Congress catalogue has a list of canonical subject headings that you can use as keywords. Um, now, come to file names. These are some of the, my favourite horrendous file names. Um, yeah, uh, now just uh, use uh, this, this one, actually a friend of mine did send me a file, a photo with that name. So be, uh, no, there's no place for humor in digital outputs. Okay, um, we, uh, I would say, I mean, I'm not gonna go through all these, but I'm sure you're familiar with having received files of colleagues with some of these names as well. So, um, you know, uh, I would say that this is one of uh, uh, Daniel's file names, actually, which I'm very pleased to receive. And, um, you know, this is just the, uh, within the context of the repository, this makes sense. It's the ID for the uh, inscription on our, our SIDM platform. Okay, so do change the file names because every person who then has to download your data set, which I know there will be thousands of, um, have to then rename the files. Who, on JSTOR, for example, you have to rename that file every time you download it. Um, I don't, they don't seem to give you it in a nice format. They use their own um, ID. Right. Um, licensing. Um, Zenodo gives a Creative Commons BY out license by um, default. That's fine for me, but some of you may not want your uh, Sanskrit used by any commercial company um, and so you can perhaps want to change that to um, uh, prevent uh, commercial use, okay? Uh, something you should think about too. And um, finally, break down the data. That's something for discussion really. Do you upload all your data as a single, um, as a, a single like, zip file as we discussed this morning? or as a single, in a single repository with all the information there, or do we break it down into the individual sections so that that individual piece of the data could be cited separately? If that's something the project needs to discuss um, further. Right, so that's uh, the data. So that's, once we've got that in place, that base of the pyramid in place, um, I think we can then move on to resources. Now, Many, what do I, many of you contribute to digital resources? And I'm talking about the specialist academic resources like Gretel or Sarit or the Archaeological Data Service, but I'm also talking about broader resources like Flickr um, or Instagram. Um, you, people on the project may want to think about publishing in those areas. It's quite gratifying to see your um, images reused in people's blogs wherever, okay? So, um, it's, that's, uh, it, that's, uh, that's, that can be nice too. Um, now, I'm defining resources as domain specific in that they deal with a single type of data, um, often with a specific period or geography, geographical area or language, um, and they're usually presented on the web in a format that's understandable and accessible. So you're not needing to, you don't need to download a, for, a file to look at those, to look at that, those data. Um, that's how I would define a resource. I mean, we could argue about that. Um, why, now, why deposit your data on, uh, on resources? Um, there's a community already in place. There's, they have a larger and broader audience than if you deposited your data separately. Um, they're often more accessible. For example, they're optimized for search engines. Uh, they, um, you can take advantage of added value functionality 
such as display on the map. Um, and they often give you a canonical URL for citation as well, which um, may be more useful in uh, publication than a Zenodo DOI, um, because you can take all your, all your different um, pieces of data from the same place. Now, choose wisely when selecting resources. Uh, there's a lot of effort often involved in structuring your data to um, put on the resource and to meet the standards that the resource um, requires. Um, what if the resource goes down? How, what, how long will this resource be available for? Um, you should also you know, read the terms and conditions <laughs> or, um, and, uh, or um, and, uh, some of these resources you have to pay for as well. Okay, so we have our very own Beyond Boundaries resource, um, SIDM.UK. This is, um, it's uh, recently gone live, but it's still under development. And um, I think Daniel will be talking about this in more detail tomorrow. So I'm probably not gonna go into it in too much detail, but we're hoping scholars will um, contribute their inscriptions to SIDM. And uh, over the remainder of the project, we'll be trying to promote this um, and its use by further projects in the future, um, dealing with Asian South Asian inscriptions and inscriptions from Asia more widely too. Uh, so we'll come back to that. Now, I'm running, I don't know if how much time I've got left really. I was gonna talk about linked data for a short time, but um, without explaining the technical considerations of linked data, you may know this is a semantic web. Um, this is a way of, uh, Exposing, sharing, and connecting pieces of data um, using a method of structuring data with a particular variant of XML or JSON. And there are many ways to use linked data, but um, I'm interested in, for our project, in connecting digital resources that have something in common, whether that's place, person, time, or another entity. So by simply using an identifier that's common across these resources, it's possible for machines and um, also uh, to harvest data and um, aggregate it in the kinds of portals that we heard about this morning with numismatics. And um, I would argue that every project needs to think about this because we need a world on the, of the web where people can get from resource to resource through a graph like this. And if you have an interest in a particular place um, you should be able to access data from all the resources about that place, not just that one resource. Otherwise, um, otherwise you're, you're, you're cut off. Okay? Um, and in South Asia, there's, uh, there's a pundit, which is a gazetteer and a prosopography uh, of, it's quite, um, well, I don't know how new it is, but it's certainly still in its infancy, I would say. And... Um, providing these. And wouldn't it be great if we could just click through here, if I had an interest in um, Sop and Surapuram, and click through there and find data from, on, from inscriptions, from coins, from uh, texts, all about that place. And um, linked data is the really the only way we're gonna achieve this. And, and, and any project working any humanities project needs to be thinking about how they can contribute to um, um, this collective effort. Okay. So what does this mean for you on the project? Well, come and speak to me, um, and uh, we can see if we can get your places into Pandit or another gazetteer, and what we can do to try and build links between uh, your data and others. So we're... On, I'm on to the final digital output now, which is tools. And um, I'm defining tools as something that facilitates an analysis of a data set. A tool to interpret or manipulate data, often providing innovative results. Um, and there can be great variation in the types of manipulation or analysis you can do with these tools. We're talking about visualization, annotation, calculation. You might be able to feed in the data yourself or the data might set might exist within the tool. And examples of tools include READ or um, the Mapping the Jewish Communities of the Byzantine Empire project I told you before. That was a 
web GIS, um, or, or set of web maps for browsing data on those communities, and um, that's also a tool. So, um, now it's, it's rant time now, um, uh, unfortunately. So as someone who's, been, who's built a few of these tools themselves, um, and witness a lack of uptake in their use, I would say it's very important that in the humanities we understand that these tools take a lot of effort to produce, okay? Yet they have a, fin a finite life, and due to the speed at which progress in technology happens. And they really need to burn quite brightly in that period um, in which they're useful uh, in, to make them worthwhile. Now, not enough thought has gone into tool production regarding their use, the target audience, the impact they might have, and how that, they, that might be measured. You know, web design in academia does not have the harsh feedback loop of profitability that is um, in the private sector. And so large projects can, are, can gain funding and continue to um, be produced for quite a long time um, before any feedback is sought whatsoever on the interface or um, whether they're having an impact or how, that, how they might be reconfigured to do their job better. So in essence, tools are treated often like publications, but it, it's not clear that they are objects of research in their own right. So I'm gonna, if I have time, I'm gonna talk briefly about one such tool, which is uh, Orbis. Okay, now, I love Orbis. I think this is great, okay? It's, uh, uh, it allows Roman communication costs to be estimated in terms of time and expense and, I, I, um, and reveals the true shape of the Roman world, okay? Now, uh, basically you can specify an origin and a destination across the Roman world and you can find out the time that it takes to go from one to the other. Now, this is great. It's a very specific use case. Um, it's uh, had a huge amount of money um, thrown at it from Stanford. I think it's a great system. It's very easy to use. It's had a lot of publicity. You know, there's been articles about this in Telegraph, Forbes, The Hindu. It's an impressive interface. There's a lot of scaffolding around it. They had workshops to use this tool. Um, you know, it's been embedded within some traditional um, practice. Um, but if we look at the 150 citations for this tool, on Google um, Scholar, uh, uh, the tool has been, is now um, six years old. That's not bad, 150 citations. But virtually none of them use the tool for what they want, what, what it was intended for, which is measuring distance. People say, oh, this is a lovely tool. People say, oh, I'm not happy with the GIS that's underpinning this, or oh, they're not taking account of this problem, they're not taking account of that problem. But no one uses, there are very few citations of this. For, um, that use it to actually measure distances between places and improve the research because of that. So um, that's an indication of how difficult it can be to um, embed a research tool, a digital research tool, in um, scholarly practice. Okay, now, so to sum up, um, projects have high level goals and eye catching problems to solve, and many have ambitious aims which helps them to gain funding, fine. Um, you know, um, mapping the Jewish communities was supposed to help medieval historians um, use GIS. You know, that's a big, that's a big ask. Um, uh, aid the uptake of GIS. Um, Beyond Boundaries, um, you know, is uh, supposed to break down regionalism and historiography, um, a lack of interdisciplinary research, um, the national orientation of research, these kind of questions, which is, you know, very admirable aims, and, um, but can the digital outputs help to address these? Um, I think the data and resources can, by depositing our data and resources, they can um, help meet these needs and in projects more generally. And theoretically, digital tools can also help meet these high-level goals. But the successful uptake of these tools is difficult and um, has to be thought about carefully. And we also should not forget that for one of these tools, you can, um, there can be many um, traditional publications 
Um, and those in and of themselves can move a paradigm forward to address these questions and provide examples for future research. So uh, these digital outputs do need to be thought about carefully. Thanks. experience in numismatics has been that the most successful projects have been those which adapt tools that are well established and well entrenched rather than developing new tools for tasks. So just curious on you know that, that distinction between developing new tools versus waiting until the tools are well established in other fields to bring them in. Um, yeah, I think that if you have a tool that's established in, rel, rel, in um, disciplines uh, close to the one that you're working in and, it's, and it has been used well there, then there are practices in place, you know, there's, uh, there are um, methods of transferring skills between disciplines, um, there's a familiarity there. And apart from all that, there is also um, a proven use case for the tool, um, and that would that that would make it more likely to be um, that would suggest that it, there's a there's a mar available market there for it. So that's um, that is a uh, yeah that's a good that's a good example. I mean I can't think of an example. Myself. I suppose like GIS in archaeology and history, for example, GIS was picked up early in archaeology. Um, and um, slightly later in history, and um, in that early period, historians went through a lot of effort in order to try and um, historians went through a lot of effort to try and build those bridges between the two, between the use of the tool and the two and the two disciplines. Um, documenters we bring them out to London train them here and also we train people in the country so we go to Africa and to China and train them there and one of the things we always tell them is if there's a really cool research project that develops a tool for linguistic annotation don't touch it do not go close to it don't be a beta tester because when the funding runs out the tool goes down you don't get the data out right so one, this is one of the problems of the short funding cycles that are then a mm -hmm. tool is created for a particular project tailored to a particular project and you don't know if this can be sustained afterwards because funders also don't fund the maintenance and further development of something, right? They fund new stuff, new stuff, new stuff. So there's a structural problem within the funding uh, stream that doesn't allow for further development of tools. So in linguistics, for example, one of the most bizarre situations is that the most stable tools, the lexical databases that our linguists worldwide use are tools that are developed by the missionaries by Christians, by SIL, right? So, and they don't want to use them, but it's the most stable, it's the best developed software that is out there. And there is nothing on the market that can compare to them <coughs> that is open source and uh, non-proprietary. But they have a constant funding stream. Hmm. Right? And everything else that was developed by others, like by the Max Planck and Nyman, <laughs> or, you know, by the Dogs Project, had a three life cycle of three to six years, and then went down, no further development, or by CNRS with Amina Mitucci and went down, so it's mm. one of the biggest problems with tools. Yeah. Um, the, uh, yeah, they're, you know, the web moves forward very quickly, and unless you can build a real um, momentum behind a, a tool, it's very difficult for it to have any longevity. You know, open, um, making the tool open source is um, to some extent uh, um, can help, but building an open source community around a code base is very uh, challenging, very challenging, unless there that, unless the, um, the people working in employment full time 
use the, that code on a day-to-day -day basis and have to make changes in order to do their job more effectively, open source code-based projects generally um, fall flat. Um, so, because, you, you know, obviously people will do things in their spare time, but in order to make major um, software upgrades, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a lot easier if people are using that in a commercial um, setting or in their, or in, not just commercial setting, but in their day-to-day -day work. All of this said, um, I'm just curious whether you can uh, think of any uh, tool, digital tool, developed in a funded humanities research project that has been an unqualified success. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there's one um, actually I've been using called Recogito. Um, it's an it's uh, an it's an it's annotations. Um, Basically, you annotate. Uh, you, you can annotate any type of text, but it's mainly being used by classicists. Um, and the annotation produces linked data that I was talking about before. So, you, when you annotate the um, text, you, uh, you annotate. At the moment, it's working with place names, and then after doing that, you link the put. You say you see room. You link that to the uh, URL of room in the gazetteer, like um, Pleiades, and then um, you. Uh, and then that is pub. Then that edition is then published in the Recogito um, editions, which are then made accessible. So people searching Rome can then find that um, text, and they'll know it's that. Like you know, Rome's one example. But Alexandria, say they'll know which Alexandria it is. Um, and uh, you know, there's a big, been a big uptake of that actually. There's a lot of editions in the Recogito um, edition base, but um, whether then that's gone through to the users, I, I, I don't know how often people are using that in their research as yet. I think that, that there is another very obvious example, uh, Portable Antiquities Scheme. Right. Is by far the most successful humanities uh, uh, digital tool project in the world, but it's supported by British government at enormous cost, has enormous numbers of staff, institutional backing, right? So all of these things we literally just talked about, and it runs off technology, which conceptually is, is very old, and was quite old even when it was in place. So they, you know, all of these things we've just kind of discussed are present there, and I think there are now, uh, I was told, over 100 PhDs, right, dependent on the Portable Antiquity Scheme data. Uh, Recently, so you know this is the this is a clear example of a project that has succeeded. It has led to research outcomes. Oh yeah, enormous yeah. numbers of research outcomes. Yes. And then, if, if I may, about JPEGs, <laughs> uh, we digitized these two photo albums in the in the BL right uh, of a uh, uh, archaeological survey of India Burma Circle, and the BL kindly gave me uh, JPEGs and TIFF files for every image, and. You, you, you can't, like, or I don't know, I can't upload TIFF files, they're too big. Like, mm -hmm. I, I let it upload to Zenodo for 20 hours, and then at some point it just dies, the, mm -hmm. the connection. Mm -hmm. So I've uploaded the JPEGs because I was able to. <laughs> no, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah, no, that is fair enough. No, it's a good, it's a good point. It's not always possible to upload these big format. Uh, uh, I would say that in most cases, uh, or like natural pictures, so if it's not line art or not a, a color diagram or something like that, but a photograph, even if it's a photograph of an inscription or of line art, a JPEG, a good quality JPEG, is not going to make a difference that matters. The issue with the JPEG is a migration one. If the JPEG is opened and subsequently resaved, it loses a little bit of data. It yes, acts like yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So if all you're doing is archiving an image, there are the risks are much smaller than if you're actually using images. Right? But if your archive in some way has to save the things later, then... Uh, uh, yes, but I mean, unless you're doing that as a chain, so opening it, uh, retouching a little part and resaving it as JPEG, and then doing that again 10 times in succession, yeah. then it's still not going to matter. Yeah. Okay. We'll let you away with a couple of JPEGs. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I, have. <laughs> I have a naive user's question. 
um, which is not ad hominem about Daniel's brilliant file name. But um, what was missing is any reference in the file name itself to a version number or something like that. Shouldn't that be an important part of the easily accessible information about that file? That I should be able to look at it and see where it fits Inside, you know I mean? inside the um, Zenodo versioning system. Who knows if he's gone back and fixed his file and re-upped it or... Yeah, like there's a date. There's a date. So, so, so the, there's a, there is a version date then that's available in the metadata. Yeah, yeah. Visible yeah. file. You can't go back no. and change something on Zenodo. You can only upload a new version. But if you upload something to Zenodo, it gets a DOI and it becomes fixed from that point on. But you can't go back and change it. You can upload a new version on top of it, but you can't go back and change the original. So I would argue that a Zenodo upload should um, just have, should not have a version number in it. I would say that that comes in the metadata. The example yeah, you gave was an XML file. If uh, I have downloaded that XML file onto my computer, how am I going to know? If you didn't take notice of, of the version number on the Zenodo web page, then that's your problem. How, wait, 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 no. Before you blame me, how am I supposed to take notice of that? Where am I supposed to store that information? Uh, the place where you download it from. Well, no, but, uh, what, but that means that you're talking about the same problem which we talked about from, from JSTOR, which is now I have to retype a file name. So you want me to input the date that I downloaded this into no, the file name? Not all yeah. metadata can fit in a file name. I understand that, but what I'm saying is, where am I I'm serious about this? Where am I supposed to keep track of that information? But unless you're not unless what I meant to do to. is to go back and not to download the material, not to download the XML file, but to go back and retrieve it every single That's time. Un unless unless you want to download uh, specifically, you want to download the earlier version, you would just always download the latest version from Zenodo, and that's that. What, what, what so I'm not going to have anything locally. I well, because you may have a version of the file locally already. Then you go into Nodo, oh, there's a new version. I'll download it. How do I How tell power from the old version? version. It is a fair point you're making, yeah. And you could make your phone name match the Zenodo <coughs> version as well. I mean, ideally, you would just, you could do things automatically in terms of, if you're relying on some set of files for some project of yours and you want those to be up to date, you can have it push those files every night or once a week or something. I'm just, I'm not arguing a particular position, I'm just wondering how can, on, with the assumption that starting with the best position I can build something which is not going to need to be fixed later, let's think about things like that. Where should that information be? But there is, this is partly, you're asking for someone who's, who's filing their data to handle your own <coughs> workflow problems. <laughs> what, is, what is most interesting about this discussion, it tells us also something that, great, you put everything on Zenodo, who knows how to use it, right? Mm. That's the thing. It's, it's a very advanced kind of knowledge system to know, you know, you download it, you work with the new one, no, you don't keep local copies, you work with always the newest one, because this is the logic that is behind it. Um, this is what we see with our linguists. They have never worked with the digital collections in our archive because they're not used to teaching and in training. So they have a really hard time understanding how to create them. And Zenodo is great, it's fantastic, but there is a gap in the, in the training from the user perspective of how to use it, how to download it. So having it in, sitting in Zenodo, my, one of the questions is like, who are we serving? It's a very, very small community of users that are able to manage this kind of data set. Well, um, yes and no. So the, uh, develop, the developing countries, sharing with the developing countries is kind of a funny idea. Well, yes and I mean, I've been here for standing here for quite a long time now, so I know I should wrap this up. But yeah. I think you know, <laughs> okay. you were in plenty of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Questioners who were responsible. No, it's just it's just an indication. <laughs> <that's interesting laughs> Um, I would say no, Zenodo is. It's, it's picking your brain, you know, it's getting your. But I would say Zenodo is a very simple platform to use, at first sight. And then, I mean, you can just download this file. And, uh, and okay, reconstructing like a relational database. Um, like, say, I, I, I worked 
you know, I'm recon I've worked with researchers from many parts of the world, and I think that they're perfectly capable of downloading TXT files and looking and viewing them. Um, that's you know, or uh, C or you know, a CSV file in a spreadsheet is um, quite not is not too difficult. I know obviously not everybody can do that, but um, I think you're. Yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Somebody's got to be a moron. 